We're going to continue on now with our subject matter of the blessings of Abraham. And the last time that I had spoken with you, uh, we had gone through until we had gotten to the change of the name of Jacob to Israel. And I hope it's been interesting and exciting to you to learn these things because this is really a part of history that's going to reach all the way up until the return of Jesus Christ. And that ought to excite all true Christians. And I hope that I'm giving it in a manner that, that is acceptable and, and uh, well put, logically put, and chronologically put, I guess you would say, because we're going to go through the whole system here. And we began there in Genesis with God's dealing with Abraham originally and how that he promised him these, these great blessings. And it's passed on down then through Isaac and then his son uh, Jacob. And now we're coming on down to the, where his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. If you'd like to, turn in your Bibles here. I'll just read you a couple of verses here. But in Genesis 32 uh, and verse 24, this is about uh, Jacob wrestling. It's called a man or a person, and he wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, this turns out to be, if you'll check all the references there, if you'll read... Uh, um, Verse, let's see, where were we? Verse 24, and we could read, uh, when he saw this being or this man, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, verse 25, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and as he wrestled with him. And he said, uh, the man that he was wrestling with there, let me go for the day breaketh. And uh, this is Jacob said, let me go. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And we brought out the fact that only God could bless him or a God being. So in fact, this was a God being uh, such as the one that allowed his hind parts to be seen of Moses as he gave him the Ten Commandments there. He looked like a human being, but he would not let him see his face and only saw his hind parts as he walked by a crevice there that he was hidden in. But this is the same type situation where this supreme being could empty himself of his glorious state, glorified state, and actually wrestle with a man. So anyway, Jacob stayed with it. And he told him there, uh, verse 27, he said unto him, What is thy name? Uh, and he said, Jacob. Well, Jacob means supplanter or deceiver or heel grabber and all those type things. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel, uh, our prevailer, one who has prevailed, shall be thy name. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And in verse 30, uh, we read there that he uh, was the Lord God. He said, I have seen God face to face. So we'll move on then in our uh, manuscript here, our subject matter about Abraham and the manifold and unbelievable blessings that God Almighty promised to him if he would do certain things. And he fulfilled all those agreements, covenants that he made with him. All right, let's go to... Um, we had discussed, too, that Reuben of the 12 sons of Israel was the firstborn from Leah. Now, that's the wife that was less pleasing to uh, Jacob uh, than was Rachel. Rachel was his favorite. But uh, Reuben was born to Leah. But he did not receive the birthright because of this. In Genesis 35 and verse 22, I'll read you this. Came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben, Reuben the firstborn, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, uh, committed incest, you might say. And Israel heard it, and uh, the sons of Jacob were 12 all total. But he removed the birthright from Reuben because of this. And we'll read the scripture describing that in another uh, chapter. Now, this firstborn's birthright would pass on to another son, as we'll uh, see later. Judah, uh, not to Judah, but to another son. But now Judah, from whence we get the name Jew, was born from Leah. And he would receive the right of the uh, leadership, the kingship, you might say. In fact, Christ came down from Judah through David 
and uh, that uh, genealogy. And so he's a very important tribe, the Jews are. But the birthright itself goes to another tribe. We'll get into that later. All right, now let's get into the subject of Jacob's pillar stone. Have you heard about that? Well, maybe you have. Some of you are studious in the Bible and all that. But let's read about Jacob's pillar stone, how that came about. Let's go back to Genesis 28 here then. And in verse um, 13, we'll read this. Well, he had this dream in verse 11. He dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And this is not Jack and the beanstalk, but I, probably that's where that came from. And, uh, but anyway, he saw this ladder. This is another thing that sometimes people will twist and rest a scripture like this. Oh, that's the way we go to heaven, by a ladder or symbolically. Don't believe that. We don't go to heaven, uh, period as we'll learn in another subject matter sometime. But anyway, he saw this ladder, and uh, angels were going up and down, ascending and descending upon him. Verse 13 now, Behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am, and remember that's one of the names of God, that when uh, Moses was going to lead Israel out in the Exodus uh, later on in time, that he said, well, what, what's your name? He said, tell him, I am sent you. So it's one of the names of God. I am. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. So it's come on down now. And the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So here was a part of the dual blessings that Abraham was to receive, the uh, secular blessings of great wealth and nations and, and uh, becoming powerful nations and rulers over other people. But then there was the grace part of the promise that from his descendancy would become the Messiah. And in thy seed, singular, shall all the nations, Gentile, Greek, Jew, Israelite, whatever, will all nations be blessed. And certainly that has to come through Jesus Christ, Messiah. And to thy seed, in thy seed, now here's the physical part of it, thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, east, north, and south. Worldwide, he would, he would be a colonizing people. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, it reverts back to the Messiah, the race and the grace part of the promises. Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. Now then, verse 16, we get into this thing about Jacob's uh, pillar stone. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep. He'd had this dream. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He didn't realize that he was in the presence of God at the time he laid down. But now he realized something was greater than what he had thought was going on here. And he was afraid. And he said, how dreadful is this place? There is none other but, this is none other but the house of God. Keep that in mind, the house of God. That applies to a, a whole group of people. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone for, uh, for his pillows, P-I-L-L-O-W-S, like a pillow you sleep on. And he set it up, now it changes, to a pillar, P-I-L-L-A-R, an upright stone, or a piece of stone that he had laid in his head on. Probably padded his head with his jacket or whatever, but he had used that for a pillow. Now he paid attention to this stone and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. Well, what a strange procedure to pour oil on a rock. But that's what he did. And he called the name of that place Bethel, because that does mean house of God, Bethel. But the name of that city written in the woods was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, if he will bless me, and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, just provide my needs so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. 
So here is a, where it's kind of like a repentance where he's yielded himself to God finally. Now he'd used subtlety there before. And this stone, there is a great importance to this stone. Jesus Christ is called a rock and probably represents him. This stone was a representation of God Almighty. This stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So he said, I will tithe God. So here he had submitted himself now to the ways of God. Going on then in verse um, chapter 35. We'll move on ahead here a few chapters. Chapter 35 and in verse uh, 9. A God appeared unto Jacob again. <clears throat> when he came out of Padan Aram, and blessed him. So God was going to be true to his word. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. He's just telling him again, Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Now then, I would like for you to pay real close attention to these following verses. It's very, very important. You may remember the rest of the story. Uh, let me see if I'm in the right place here. Well, I seem to have lost a page here, but we'll find it in a moment. Greetings again here. I got uh, momentarily clogged up in my throat as well as losing a piece of my notes here, and I didn't want to uh, leave out anything that I feel is very important to this subject matter. But we'd come down to where uh, Jacob's name had been changed to Israel. And uh, then we talked about Jacob's pillar stone. We've covered all of that. Now then we came on down to where he again uh, changed his name to Israel in uh, Genesis 28, in those verses. Now then I'd ask you to pay close attention to the following verses here that uh, I didn't want to leave out and I had the wrong set of uh, notes up here. But in verse 11 here, <clears throat> excuse me again, verse 11 of Genesis uh, 28, or rather Genesis 35 now, Genesis 35, and in verse 11, God said unto him, speaking to Jacob here, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation, now notice this, keep this in mind, this is very important. <clears throat> Because this actually tells us where we, modern Americans and Britons, came from. This is the beginning of the information that I'm going to give you. But a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings, notice this, kings, plural, shall come out of thy loins. Now, do you think Jacob at that time, he had 12 sons there, and uh, I guess different stages, different ages. He had two wives and two uh, uh, handmaids from his wives there that he had produced 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 12, but a nation, a singular great nation and a company, and I've heard this explained and it can mean a commonwealth of nations shall come of thee. Verse 12, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, and he told him to look north, south, east, and west westward, they were going to be colonizers and reach around the globe eventually, and they would become the greatest nations on the face of this earth. Will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give this land. Notice it's land that he's giving here. Verse 13, and God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And again, Jacob set up a pillar, P-I-L-L-A-R. Remember, he had this dream, and he slept on a stone that he called a pillow, P-I-L-L-O-W, but now it's called a pillar, and he poured oil on it. Where he had talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering. This was a special stone, and he recognized that. He said, surely this must be the house of God that he equated with this stone. 
Keep that in mind. Very important. He poured a drink offering thereof, thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And verse 15, Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel, which means Beth, house of God, Bethel. Now, did you notice this? He poured oil on him. He poured a drink offering on him, on it. So it wasn't an ordinary stone that God had provided there undoubtedly that he laid his head upon. So undoubtedly then from this, uh, Jacob had continued to carry that same pillar stone with him that we previously read about in Genesis 28. You see, we're over here in uh, three or four or five chapters later. And we'll see the great importance of that later on. Now, I'll not be able to spend a lot of time here, but how this fits in with the blessing of Abraham, but it does. Most surely it fits in with the blessings of Abraham and the covenant that he made with him. So with this in mind, what has this P-I-L-L-A-R, pillar stone of the great patriarch Jacob have to do with a modern nation or nation called Britain or England has a great deal to do with that. And uh, you will be, as I was, astonished and uh, amazed at the answer to this question. But it ties in with another covenant. Now, you've got the covenant made with Abraham, passed on to Isaac and Jacob, but you've got another, another covenant made with David about the, his throne. And we'll get into that in great detail. But it ties in with the covenant of the throne of David. And it's a separate covenant, but they intermesh, they tie together very well. But if you'll remember, moving forward here a bit, and sort of, I put this in parenthetical express, uh, part. If you'll remember the story of the Exodus, uh, when Moses uh, brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they finally reached Mount Sinai, and God made a covenant with them and established them as his nation. His nation, his house, you might say, among other kingdoms of the world at that time. Now, this is 400 and something years nearly later. The government was a theocracy, and it was ruled over by God through a system of judges. You know, after the Pentateuch there, the, uh, ending with Deuteronomy, then you've got Joshua uh, taking over the uh, role or uh, responsibility of Moses, who died, and they buried him. So you go through Joshua, now you get to the book of Judges, and God ruled through a system of judges for a good long while. <clears throat> In this system, it contained civil, as well as spiritual and religious laws that were given uh, directly by God. So Israel was both church and state at that time, a theocracy, church and state. <clears throat> And it was given also, in addition to these laws and things, they were given ritualistic laws, which included animal sacrifices and meat and drink offerings, and they were carnal or fleshly ordinances, you might call them. But it also was a civil government and, and required civil laws as well as we have today. And a lot of our laws are based on the Ten Commandments. You think about it. Murder and stealing, things like that, that's based on God's law. There, are also, there were also statutes and judgments, and they were the central code of law. They were based on the overall spiritual law, which is the Ten Commandments. Now, after leaving Egypt, God, as I said, was Israel's king for several generations, and they worked under this uh, system of judges. Now, you can read about this history in Moses' writings and Joshua and Judges. And we'll find that Israel, frankly, was always rebellious against God. They did not want to follow his ways. Even some of their champions, like Samson, he delighted in strange women and things like that. And he had to pay a penalty, finally. His eyes were gouged out, and finally he brought the temple down. But because of his wrong choices, he paid the penalty. As you always do, when you sin, you pay a penalty. It can be forgiven, but that penalty will remain with you many times throughout your whole life. We'll carry along with you. Now then, let's come down then to the story of Joseph. Joseph is a very important player in all of this, and about this nation and uh, commonwealth, our group of nations, and Joseph plays a very prominent role in this. 
Now, most people have heard, heard the story of Israel's favorite son, Joseph. Remember, the, his other sons sold him to an uh, Islamic group that came through. They sold him and said, in fact, one of them said, I believe it was Judah, they were going to kill him at first because they were so jealous of the way their father uh, thought about him. And uh, Judah spoke up and said, well, they'd put him in a pit. He said, what profit is there if we sell him? Or if we kill him, said, let's sell him. So they sold their own brother into slavery, and they took him down to Egypt. And as you know, God had this all planned. And Joseph saved the whole nation of Israel from severe famine. And he had, uh, the Pharaoh had a dream, and he interpreted that seven years would be plenty of food available. But then the following seven years would be a time of drought and famine. And he advised the Pharaoh to store up this foodstuffs. And he saved the whole nation, nation of Israel. In fact, he was appointed something like a prime minister, perhaps. Second in command only to Pharaoh. And eventually took an Egyptian wife, by the way, from whence he had two sons. But anyway, this is an amazing story, but God had a hand in it in every case. And when his brothers came down there to get grain and left their father up there and where they were living and things were getting very uh, uh, harsh up there, and Joseph recognized them, but in his Egyptian garb and makeup, they didn't recognize him. Some time had passed, 14 years at least. So he filled up their sacks and everything. You know the story, you can follow that. In fact, I saw a very good presentation about Joseph recently, and uh, it wasn't filmed in Hollywood. It was filmed in Italy, I believe, and it was more uh, correct as far as the uh, scriptural references and the way they presented than anything I've ever seen come out of Hollywood. I'll say that. Very good story. And the parts were played well, and they, it uh, fit with the Bible. Lo and behold. <laughs> but it was made in uh, Italy. <clears throat> Anyway, well, you know the story of, uh, it's usually told as a children's story, but it has far, far more importance than the story for children. And uh, we'll highlight the main verse, but in Genesis 37 here, let's move over another chapter. And in verse 1, we'll read, and Jacob, whose name had been changed to Israel, remember, dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And that's where he first brought uh, Abraham out of, you know. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of, of his old age, and that is true a lot of times. I had a brother. He, uh, he died early on, but he was my father's favorite because he was an older man. When he had him, it was about 10 years difference, and he and the next to the youngest. And my father really doted on the young man, and I liked him. Likeable person, great personality and all that, but he died an untimely death. But he loved him more than his children loved Joseph because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Oh, we hear a lot about that. That is, a, a children are excited about that and they wonder what it looked like. I'm sure it was one of the finest garments that you could ever purchase, much like the robe of Jesus Christ that they gambled over at his death, or you'll remember. Verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him. Doesn't that happen? I've seen that happen in families where the children get jealous of the favorite and they'd do them in if they got an opportunity and could not speak peacefully unto him. Just fussed and argued and reviled him, I guess. Verse 12, dropping on down, and his brethren uh, went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And you remember the rest of the story there. Uh, he sent uh, his son Joseph out there with some foodstuffs. And when Joseph found his brothers, they began plotting to kill him. Here he came in his nice uh, multicolored coat and all that that his father had either had made or purchased or something, real fine garment. They began plotting to kill him as they saw him coming. Verse 18 tells us this. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired to slay him, their own brother. Just very recently, we had a killing here in uh, our area where one brother shot the other brother to death. But the other one was shooting at his house and threatening him. But still, he went to the full extent and slew his own brother. So it's nothing new that these things happen. They stripped him of his beautiful coat. They threw him into a pit, and they were going to leave him there to die. But a caravan of traders happened to be coming through. You remember parts of the story, surely, if you've studied the Bible any, any at all. It's very interesting, exciting. 
Well, it did make a good movie if you do it right. They usually don't do it right. But uh, they were going to leave him there to die, but a caravan of traders came through, and the elder brother, Reuben, had compassion on him. And Reuben seemed to be a pretty decent person, except that thing that he did with his father's concubine and knocked him out of having the birthright, being the firstborn. He had compassion on Joseph and really wanted to spare him. Verse, read verse 21 and 22 here in this chapter. But Judah agreed, or argued rather, to sell his own brother to these Ishmaelite merchants. That's, it identifies him as that. Verse 26, Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is there if we slay our brother and con conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Now that was heartless, to say the least. Well, that's what they all agreed to do then. And, when they, and then they had to figure out a way to appease their father when they returned without Joseph. And you can imagine how ag agitated he would be of his son not being with him, his favorite son. So they concocted a story about him being slain by a wild beast. In fact, they killed one of the lambs there and, and uh, vinced his pretty coat, his nice coat, in that blood to convince their father that surely he had been slain by a wild animal, probably a lion. But they uh, returned to their father. Now, these wicked brothers had no idea. They didn't know that this was planned by the great God for his purpose. You can continue then with the full account of how Joseph became elevated by Pharaoh of Egypt to uh, something, as I mentioned, a prime minister. He had many trials, by the way. He was tempted by uh, a young uh, married woman there and uh, she tried to seduce him, and he refused to do that. He was a man, a young man of great character, and as she fled, she grabbed his cloak there and said that he had tried to rape her, so he went to prison over that, and that's all a part of the story, but it's an amazing thing that the man had to prove that he would stand true to God's way, and God trusted him uh, much more after that, but he had to prove his loyalty and obedience to God. Uh, but finally, God was able to in, uh, save the entire nation of Egypt and other surrounding territories, as well as Joseph's own family, eventually, in the story flow there. And, but God figured now that he had a man he could trust, and that man was Joseph. It's too bad a lot of us are not more like Joseph. But chapters 39 through 50, I'll leave that out, but please put these things down, or in your mind, put it on notes. Read these exciting chapters. You'll get a great deal of not just enjoyment, but uh, learning uh, from these chapters. And it describes the times of Joseph's actions in Egypt, where he finally was able to bring his entire family down. In fact, if I remember correctly, about 70 people came down of his relatives when they first came down to Egypt, and they grew into a great nation. But they finally became slaves there, you'll remember, because Pharaoh's changed, and soon they forgot these great wonderful deeds that Joseph had done under that Pharaoh. But anyway, that's another part of the story. But he, he brought his father Jacob down to Egypt finally, and this is how the Israelites, Israelites wound up in Egypt for 430 years. And uh, they had to be delivered by Moses in the Exodus, and that's another story, but Exodus 12, verses 40 and 41 gives the beginning of God dealing with Moses, and he's going to bring his people out who were oppressed, but they've been brought down there originally by Joseph. Now, Joseph had died in the interim there, but he made them promise that he knew that in his mind that they would be leaving someday, and he uh, made them promise that, take my bones out of here. He might have been embalmed like these Egyptian mummies. Probably it was, because he lived in, in that area and probably was embalmed. Now then, this will bring us down, at least we'll get started in this area I'm calling, uh, we will call chapter 4. And this is one of the greatest prophecies in the Bible. I know I, I sound excited, and I am excited. And these are the greatest promises that could ever be passed on to any human being, directly from God the one who became Jesus Christ, actually. Now, this is about the sons of Joseph. This is most interesting that he had while in Egypt, and their names were Ephraim and Manasseh. Keep those, write them down if you like. 
N A S S E H and Ephraim, E P H R A I M. Turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis 48 now. We'll move ahead here and cover a little bit more territory for sake of time and getting you at least the outline of what we're talking about and how it applies to the blessings of Abraham and all these promises that he gave to him by a covenant. <clears throat> Genesis 48 and in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, your father is sick. Jacob, Jacob had gotten old and he was ready to die. Now remember the promises had been passed on to Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now he's going to pass this on to one particular son whose name is Joseph. Now while he was there in Egypt, he had fathered two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. Your father is sick, and he took, him with, took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 2, And one told Jacob, and said, Behold, your son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself, he's in the bed, and sat upon the bed. Verse 3, And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz, or Bethel, when he had his dream, you remember? He appeared to him there in the land of Canaan and blessed me. So the blessings are still flowing. They're still uh, continuing. Verse 4, And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. Going to have a lot of children. And I will make of thee a multitude of people. Notice this. A multitude of people. And will give this land to thy seed. For your descendants, I'm going to pass this on down. For an everlasting possession, an everlasting possession. That's a long time. and <laughs> That's forever. Verse 5, And now thy two sons that he had with him, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came down unto thee into Egypt, are mine. They are the same as mine. Now notice this. As Reuben and Simeon, two of his other sons, Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. In other words, they would become equal to the rest of his sons and even more, for they were of Joseph's uh, descendants, and Joseph has the birthright. We'll read later on, the birthright passed on to Joseph, not Reuben, who lost it because of his incest with his father's concubine. We read about that. Verse 8, and Israel beheld Joseph's son and said, Who are these? Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. While well, I've been here in Egypt. And he said, uh, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me. Bring them up to me, and I will bless them. I will bless them, he said. Verse 10, Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them then up to his father. And he embraced them, verse 12 tells us. And Joseph brought them from between his knees as small children. They would stand between his knees. And he bowed himself with his face to the earth, had great respect to his father, and he knew this blessing was coming from God, so he bowed with his two sons there. And Joseph took them both. I want you to pay attention to this strange tale. He took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, which would be guiding him toward uh, Jacob's left hand, you see. Now, notice this. And brought them, Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel, Jacob, or Israel, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim. Uh-oh, he wasn't the firstborn. He crossed his hands. Who was the younger, and he laid his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, this is very important that we know and understand who this is. And I may not be able to get all the way into it in this session, but anyway, it's a great importance. It's a, it's a worldwide important thing. Verse 16, The angel which redeemed me from all evil took care of him all this time, bless the lads, and notice this. Please remember this. 
verse 16, let my name, what was his name now? Israel. Let Israel be named on them, these two sons of Joseph. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude, a multitude in the midst of the earth. We're going to see later on that this actually amounts to billions of people. You don't find that in the Jewish people. Billions. But we'll get to that later. <clears throat> now the physical covenant promises were to be divided between these two sons of Joseph. Verse 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, he knew something was wrong. It displeased him. Well, it didn't displease him in, in a sense, but it, it uh, agitated him perhaps. It, wait a minute. He thought his daddy was old and, and had gotten the wrong hand on the, on the wrong blessing or something. He, held, he lifted his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head under Manasseh's head because he was the firstborn. <clears throat> Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put, my, put thy right hand upon his head. Notice the answer. His father refused. He put it back down on the young lad's head. His father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know what I'm doing. But you know, sometimes young men are impetuous and they think, well, dad's just sort of confused here and he didn't really know what he was doing. Oh, he knew exactly what he was doing. I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall be great, but his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations, again, or a commonwealth of nations. Now, remember the promise to Jacob in Genesis 35 and 11, practically the same language, same language, verse 20. And he blessed them in that day, and he, he said, let my name be named on them. So in actual fact, the name of Israel belongs to these two sons, not especially the Jews, although the Jews are one of 12 sons of Israel. So yes, Jews are Israelites, but these two young boys are not Jews. And has been explained, uh, if you're uh, in here legally, you uh, Americans, all California, you might say, or what other state, Tennessee, are Americans. But all Americans aren't Tennesseans nor Californians, if you get my drift there. Goes on then to say, of Ephraim and Manasseh, one is to be a nation destined to become the greatest single country on the earth. And the other brother is to become a multitude of nations or this commonwealth. And who has been the uh, greatest uh, colonizer in the world uh, up until uh, about eight, 1800 or maybe a few years after? That would be England. They had... Uh, countries that they controlled or ruled uh, all over the world, including Canada. But anyway, they, they owned a lot of property. They had the commonwealths in India and Africa and places like that. So they were a commonwealth. And I hope that maybe you're beginning to see or to get who God had in mind for these brothers. I'm getting pretty plain now. But they are going to become now because of this blessing. They're going to become the recipients then of the blessings of Abraham, sticking right down true to the story and the blessings that would come on Abraham. And now they're passed all the way down to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. It gets more specific now. A single nation, the greatest, and a commonwealth of nations. Now, before Jacob died, that's or Israel, if you want to call him that, he prophesied what would befall each of his 12 sons, which would become nations, all 12 of them, by the way, in the end times, as was foretold in the Abrahamic covenant. Same message. And we believe we can identify these 12 sons who have become 12 great nations today by certain characteristics and personalities. Um, I'll just give you a few of these. Uh, some of it speculation, some of it pretty provable. But Reuben very probably is France. Judah carries his own name. Judah is, or the Jews, scattered worldwide. About, I've forgotten how many million, in New York City. There's Dan, 
And he carried his name with him always. He named his uh, progeny after his father, Dan. In other words, Denmark, or the mark of Dan, pretty well easily identified there. In Ireland, there's some, a lot of Danites in Ireland. Benjamin, uh, they probably are the Norsemen and Vikings. And I don't think Hagar, <laughs> I'm kidding now, would be one of them, but they probably were the Vikings. And... Uh, Travel a lot in ships and things like that. Uh, Simeon and Levi, well, they're scattered in England and in the USA. And they are still have that hot-tempered nature about them. And uh, they say they'd rather fight than run. And they showed, they demonstrated that uh, proclivity when one of their sisters was uh, raped by some of these uh, Gentile nations. And they in fury went over there and... Uh, really wiped up the earth with them. And so they're very hot-tempered. Uh, again, the Levite priesthood came from them even. You've heard of the Levites. Well, anyway, these two brothers, four brothers, Simeon and Levi, and they're scattered in England and in the USA. I heard one minister say that he thought that a lot of them were scattered in uh, eastern Kentucky and east Tennessee. And there is, uh, we call them rednecks. And if you've ever encountered one, you will see what I mean. Quick on the trigger, but quick to forgive as well. And if, if, you, if they're a friend of yours, they're a friend for life, usually. But going on, Naphtali, we believe. Well, let's get on down then. Let's uh, uh, get down to um, Asher. We believe probably are Belgium and Luxembourg area people. Issachar, maybe Finland. Gad, and I remember this this way, Gad being the shortest spelling, three letters, we believe it's in Switzerland. We believe they are descendants of Gad. Naphtali, Sweden, perhaps. Zebulun, we believe, according to the descriptions that he gave them there, probably Holland. And then, of course, Joseph, including his two sons, would rise up far more blessed than the others. Again, because he was the recipient of the birthright. Now, Genesis 49, in verse 1, notice how far-reaching this is when he was uh, telling what would befall them eventually. Jacob called unto his son, and God said, and said, rather, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which be, shall befall you in the last days. It wasn't just for that particular time. It was for all the way through his, man's history until the last days. And you can remain, read the remaining verses here, Genesis 49, on down through there. And you think, well, how could this be possible? He talks about them being like a grain in a sieve, and yet he'd transport them and move them around, and yet not one grain would fall to the earth. Well, you must believe this is possible through the power of God. If you don't accept that, you're not going to get very far in God's Word. The power of God was able to do this and through his inspiration. In fact, Isaiah 46 gives a description of the power and the might of God. Isaiah 46 and 9 says, Remember the former things of old, he says, For I am God and there is none else. He is God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10. Notice this. He can foretell this and bring it to pass declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel, my advice, my law shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures. He is God Almighty. But now the sons, the son we want to zero in again will be Joseph here in chapter 49. It tells us about this. He was prophesying what would befall them down through history and in the end time. Genesis 49 and 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough. He would bear a lot of, of children. Even a fruitful bough by a well. In other words, he would have access to water and all that. Whose branches run over the wall. So this uh, sounds like an expansion or an extending their territory or colonizing would be a better term. Verse 23, is still talk, talking about descendants of Joseph. The archers have sorely grieved him, other nations with their war uh, machinery, and shot at him and hated him. Now, ask yourself even today, 
if you will admit the pure and simple truth, who is the most hated and envied nation on this earth at this time? I believe you would have to agree that it is the great, has been great, and still is the nation of the United States of America. Verse 24, but his bowed, his bow rather, abode in strength. God gave him extraordinary strength and power and the ability to produce war-making equipment. We were the first in flight, as you know, invented the airplane. Uh, we've had every kind of conceivable uh, tank and weaponry that we've developed over the years. We were the first with the atomic bomb. And so we've been able to hold our own very well up until recently, and it's getting a little shaky at this time. We've gotten involved in things that are not turning out as they were planned, and men make mistakes. God makes no mistakes. <clears throat> Goes on to say, Well, made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, and goes on to say in that very same verse, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Well, who is the stone of Israel? David referred to him as many, many times as the rock. And there in the New Testament, I quoted 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that that rock was Christ. So he's known as the stone of Israel. And the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is from Judah. Judah holds that right. But who has been the most powerful military nation on the earth? Well, of course, we, I believe we know. Verse 25, still speaking of Joseph and his descendants. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven, above blessings of the deep that lieth underneath. We have owned the, the greatest fish crops that have ever been uh, gotten out of the sea. And we've had abundant rainfall in due season until just re very recently. And it's getting to where water is one of the major topics, even in your leading uh, news magazines like U.S. News and World Report. Caption of the lead article was about water and the, the, the droughts and things that we're experiencing, and it's going to get worse. They're talking about now some of the farmers in one part of the nation of selling their water rights. They're not going to grow the crops. They're just going to sell their right for money well, you can't eat dollar bills very long, unless you like lettuce, and I don't think it's going to equate to that. Blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies underneath, blessings of the breast and blessings of the womb. The blessings of your father have prevailed above the blessings of your progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. America the beautiful, and from sea to sea, shining sea, what a nation! And how thankful I am to have been born here, not for my choosing, into the greatest, most bountiful nations with all these blessings that could ever be offered to mankind. How grateful. It brings me to tears to think about it leaking out now, you might say, to other nations to their benefit. Shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So the tribe of Joseph, including both of the sons, have been doubly blessed because they are of the birthright tribe, Joseph. Now let's turn to First uh, Chronicles here. I want to read you something, and this will straighten out your mind on some things. First Chronicles 5, and it, this shows a distinction of the twofold part of the blessing, physical and the uh, spiritual. But in First Chronicles and in verse 5 and in verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of whom? The sons of Joseph. The birthright went to Ephraim and Manasseh was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not reckoned after the real birthright. In other words, about Reuben. Now, we're, we've been pretty friendly with France through two world wars, but they usually lay the way or drift the way that's best for them, I'm sorry to say, but we've been allied with them. Now, verse 2, for Judah 
prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, speaking of the Messiah, but also the Messiah is to uh, be placed upon an existent throne, and that's where we come into this part about the Davidic throne covenant that ties in with the blessings of Abraham. Now, I know some of this stuff will be hard for you to absorb because we have to give it in such a shortened form, but it is well worth your study and reading and following up on this matter. And we'll continue on until we get uh, what we have studied out and believe that we've proven without a shadow of a doubt what we're talking about. But anyway, Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of all him came the chief ruler, but the birthright again was Joseph's to his two sons. So I hope you will remember that. Now then, I will... Uh, break off here pretty soon uh, with this uh, part, but read the book of Joshua, especially the 24th chapter where he addressed all the tribes of Israel again because he had taken over from Moses there, you know, and he reviewed the blessings of Abraham in Joshua, the 24th chapter. Put that down. Read the 24th chapter and try to equate to the nations that I have uh, said related to these sons and his descendants that he had fulfilled thus far. Now, Joshua 24 and verse 3, for instance, says, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. Now, here's something that's sort of confusing to some people, even students of the Bible. It's not talking about the Noatian flood. In fact, I looked this up in uh, uh, Bullinger's Companion Bible, and it actually means the Euphrates River. So he brought him from one side to the other. And that's from a companion by Bullinger. And he led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and he multiplied his seed as he had promised, and he gave him Isaac. And then it went, goes on down. <clears throat> Verse 4 tells us this. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir. That's where the Turks are today, to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. That's where they came down, the 70 persons that came down and stayed there for about 400 and something years, you know. And then the book of Judges depicts a time when Israel sometimes had good leadership and at other times bad or weak judges were placed over them or allowed to be over them. And it finally came down to a total anarchy. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. If you'll read the final words there in the book of Judges, it was just total anarchy. Judges 21 and verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, anyway, the sordid, God-rejecting history, history of Israel continued until they rebelled, and then they demanded a king. And uh, Samuel, the priest, gave them a king to be over them after the judgeship there, and instead of the system of judges. Now, the first king, of course, was King Saul. Well, he turned out to be very bad, although he was high in stature and a great man, but uh, he didn't turn out well. So then God chose another king to follow him, and this was King David. We'll have much more to really relate to you about uh, David. Uh, he t told them there that uh, Samuel said, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5, he said unto him, talking to Samuel, Samuel, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge like unto the other nations. And verse 6, the thing displeased Samuel. And when they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord, he said, Do it, Samuel. They've not rejected you. He said, They have rejected me, that I will be no king over them. So that's what it was all about. So then he did uh, allow him to, in fact, he picked out Saul. But he turned out to be a bad apple. And eventually then he had uh, of this, uh, David to be uh, ordained or anointed to be the king over Israel. So let's see if we've got time maybe just to mention one more little thing, but not much. My time, my time runneth out, as they sing King James. But verse 7, it goes on to say this, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they've not rejected thee, but they've rejected me that I should, be, should not reign over them. And thus begins a series of kings reigning over Israel, and from whence the second one would be King David.
So see you next time, and I hope you're getting something out of this. Uh, it's exciting to me to present it to you.